So we're going to be talking about post-viral syndromes today, and many of you might know people or be having personal experiences with this. We're really excited to share the newer information that's come out over the last few years about the subject, and we just want to make sure we can get through all this information that we're going to be presenting today. So please put questions in the chat box pull it up and we'll get back to those. Um, at the end, we'll go over a little Q&A. So I'm Dr. Molly Force. Um, I'm the clinical director here at Prosper Natural Health and I'm joined by Dr. Rosalie and Dr. Mary today. Our practice um, here in Port Townsend, Washington is a beautiful integration, I feel like, of holistic uh, medical models combining both the Eastern, more European approach um, with our Chinese medicine, as well as Ayurvedic medicine. And as we are blending these different approaches, we really like to come into these clinical questions that we see with a very scientific background. Um, you'll find that we really enjoy um, in information that is scientifically based and want our patients to understand what's going on with them and why we're choosing to recommend the therapies in which we're recommending. So one of the things we've started doing are these clinical spotlight series, which are free talks that we're trying to do just about every month. And they're really directed towards a specific question or clinical component that is coming up in practice, um, something that seems to be kind of a hot topic. And what we're doing is we're making sure to record those for people. So please spread the word. They're on our website. You can go to prospernaturalhealth.com and under the little education tab, you'll see the doc talks area and you can find all of those recordings. We have a whole bunch of topics that we've done and um, we just want you to be able to watch those at your leisure because really we want to make the most out of this time for you and, and um, provide good information for folks. Today with the post-viral syndrome talk, our goal is really to cover why people can find themselves having issues with post-viral syndromes, what they are in the first place. This might be a newer topic for a lot of folks. And then ways that we can reduce our risks of developing post-viral syndromes. And then of course, we're gonna wanna launch into some emerging treatments and strategies to really help prevent post-viral syndromes. So those are gonna be the goals of our topics to our topic today. It's really gonna be um, a lot of information. So like I said, pop those questions into that chat box. And I'm gonna hand this over to Dr. Rosalie, who's gonna talk about what exactly post-viral syndrome is. Thanks, Dr. Molly. So post-viral syndrome actually goes by a variety of different names, including post-infectious fatigue syndrome, post-acute infection syndrome. So when we look into the literature, we're also typing, we're also typing in these search terms. Ultimately, what you know, this umbrella term of post-viral syndrome encompasses is just a sustained presence of symptoms after an acute viral infection. There's a lot of different viruses, as we will see, that can contribute to post-viral syndrome, but the symptoms are, are fairly similar, and it really depends on the individual, which ones manifest for them. So ultimately, for how long is one of the questions we ask. Post-viral syndromes can last for weeks to months to even years after a viral infection in, in certain individuals. Typically, though, we see, we see them last between four to 12 weeks from an onset of a virus. So the onset being the first day you realize, oh, I have an upper respiratory infection. Um, what is possibly involved are many things, physical, the, the brain and the body of all uh, of all, all of the body systems can be involved. Neurological as well from, uh, again, the brain, but also the peripheral nerves. And then emotionally, I have seen this clinically quite a lot, uh, post-viral depression and anxiety. Um, and then severity really depends on the patient. 
Some patients just weather this at home and other patients come in to the doctor because they're wondering, wow, I can no longer do my, my job. I can no longer work in my garden, right? And they're having vocational or role performance disabilities in, a, in addition. So there, like I said earlier, there's a variety of viral pathogens that can lead to these post-infectious fatigue syndromes from SARS-CoV-2, the virus that leads to COVID-19, Ebola, dengue, polio, another other types of SARS viruses, chikungunya, EBV, which is also known as mononucleosis. So that's one that I also see clinically quite commonly as kind of a monoreactivation syndrome, West Nile virus, Ross River virus, Coxsackie B virus, and then a big one is the H1N1 parainfluenza virus, which when there are big flu seasons, especially with this kind of swine flu uh, subvariant, we do see some post-viral syndrome uh, symptoms pop up. And then VZ V is your varicella zoster virus, the one that is uh, most commonly known as chickenpox. So again, some core symptoms of post-viral syndrome. The, the biggest one I see is just fatigue, uh, fatigue that is disproportionate. My patients come in and say, I just can't get out of bed. And it's just, it lasts for a long time. Uh, and they start to wonder, am I still sick? Uh, but it's ultimately, they're not still sick or contagious. They're having a post-viral syndrome. Uh, exercise intolerance goes hand in hand with this in terms of, wow, I can no longer do the things I used to do before. Go for a run, work in the garden, walking up and down the stairs at my workplace. Uh, cognitive and sensory impairment, also a really big symptom here from brain fog, word finding difficulty to numbness and tingling in, in the periphery, like in your hands and feet. Uh, additionally, part of this uh, subcategory would be like muscle weakness. Um, chronic cough, another huge one. We, I see post-viral cough all the time, sometimes three months after the initial upper respiratory infection. Unresolved post-nasal drip, same, same, uh, same idea here. Just uh, put, yeah, the, the, the um, discharge from the sinuses is just not clearing uh, quite as quickly and, and you're sensing it in, in the throat. Uh, loss of sense of smell and taste, this can last for a while as well. And if you have had COVID before, this one is probably the most surprising to, to patients. Uh, like, will I ever get my sense of smell back? The answer is yes, and we'll tell you how. <laughs> um, and then lastly here, flu-like symptoms, joint and muscle pains that just are chronic um, and, and continue on. It's a big and costly concern. Uh, Post-infectious chronic disability is a whole other term when this type of, uh, when these types of syndromes are not resolving. All right, so next we're going to delve into some research about the post-viral syndrome as a whole, and then specifically long COVID as well. So, this study here looked at the prevalence of pro-spiral syndrome. Um, and in essence, they found that there is not enough research to fully understand, to fully answer that question. Um, we have, you know, long COVID has gotten a lot of press and a lot of uh, research in the last couple of years. Um, way more research than most other post-viral infectious syndromes, sorry, post-infectious syndromes um, get. And, but what's interesting is that, again, this has been present for many different viruses and long COVID is kind of showing us that this, this can be present after many kinds of viral syndrome or, or after um, infection with many different kinds of viruses. 
Um, so, so, oh, sorry, can we go back to the last one real quick? Um, so one thing that they found was that there's similar symptoms that can occur um, among um, many different post-viral syndromes. And so this suggests that there might be a common mechanism. And again, we don't really understand fully what that mechanism is, but recent studies have started to elucidate some of these potential um, underlying processes that are involved, how the viruses are affecting us long-term. And some of those may be that the pathogen is still present, so that means, you know, that the pathogen never fully left your system. This is true for many herpes viruses, for instance, or HPV. They never fully go away and they're kind of present in your tissues long term. Um, and then they can be reactivated. So that may be a part of what, what people are experiencing. Then there's an autoimmunity piece where the response to the virus can cross react with some of our tissues and cause long term issues in that way. So they're attack. So our bodies are reacting to our own tissues as if they are the virus. And then um, there's a potential dysbiosis piece. So we know that a lot of people struggle with their microbiome and changes to the microbiome after a lot of these viral illnesses. And then lastly, there's um, tissue damage during the initial viral, uh, viral response where we have really strong um, really strong immune activation and the production of a lot of um, reactive oxygen species in order to kill the viruses. And that can cause damage to our organs during that, that acute phase. So you can have damage to your circulatory system, to your kidneys, um, and things of that nature. So um, essentially, there's a lot more to uncover, but we're starting to see commonalities among many of these viral syndromes. All right, so this is just a look at, you know, the again, the prevalence of these, of symptoms persisting after the initial uh, virus. So the top is looking at in um, cases of chronic fatigue syndrome after mononucleosis, um, and then on the bottom here, we have persistent symptoms after COVID-19, and then also um, persistent symptoms, um, again, more, more uh, kind of diverse long COVID symptoms. Um, and really, I would love for you to look at the one to the bottom right there. Um, it's showing the um, you know, self-reported COVID and then reported long COVID um, with activity limitation. And we're, you know, what we're seeing is that it's tracking pretty much with our COVID diagnoses. Um, and that's just really significant that many, essentially a large part of the population are experiencing these symptoms and it's something that, again, is really important for us to keep attending to and doing more research on. So here we're going to dive into long COVID specifically and talk about a couple of different um, categories that people tend to fall into. So in the first, so there's two main subtypes of long COVID um, that we see among people who contract the, who contract COVID initially. And the first subtype is that is, is people who um, have typically had a really severe infection. So went through acute respiratory stress disease where they had, um, you know, may have been on a ventilator or, and they had significant inflammation in their lungs um, during the COVID, um, during their COVID reactivity phase. This is more common in men um, that had pre prior organ damage. Um, and it's more common in older adults. There's another kind of major category that um, of, of, of 
patients that tend to have more vague flu-like symptoms that keep going after the initial infection. And this is often seen with people that had a more mild to moderate or even asymptomatic disease. So they didn't have any symptoms of COVID-19 initially, and then they have fatigue and other symptoms crop up later. So this can include fatigue, but also cognitive and sensory changes. So you know, neuropathies, change in taste and smell, things like that. Um, headache. Uh, muscle pain or myalgia, and then recurrent flu-like symptoms. So generally being really fatigued um, and having bouts of kind of having a hard time getting out of bed. This is, again, more common in people who have had a mild or moderate infection and more common in women. And then um, Common to both of these subcategories are, are kind of the common symptoms of post-COVID syndrome. So uh, respiratory sy symptoms like shortness of breath, chest pain, and tightness, and then cough and a lack of sense of taste and smell. Okay, so we mentioned brain fog in that second category or kind of fatigue in long-term um, neurological symptoms. Um, and here we are just kind of delving into some of the prevalence of brain frog and fatigue and why it might be happening. So there were um, studies were showing in the last year or so that approximately one in three individuals experienced fatigue for 12 or more weeks after the COVID-19 diagnosis. So that's pretty significant. And then approximately one in five individuals exhibited cognitive impairment with more than with 12 or more weeks after their initial diagnosis. So cognitive impairment is less common than fatigue, but still pretty prevalent in the population. Um, so some potential underlying causes of this are um, that COVID can cause a chronic low-grade um, neuroinflammation. So the response that we initially had will initiate a, um, a, react a reaction that causes an inflammatory response in the brain. Um, and that is, again, something there's so many things we can do to treat that, and we'll discuss that later. Um, but it's a phenomenon that we're seeing in a number of individuals. Um, and then there's also potential endocrine disruption. So endocrine um, is is a fancy term for hormones. And this um, we found that covid nineteen can actually decrease our cortisol. So our cortisol is stress is our stress hormone, and that is a hormone that we want to rise first thing in the morning, and it gives us energy, and then slowly declines throughout the day so that we can go to sleep at night. And what can happen after COVID-19 is um, any damage to the hypothalamus, so a part of the brain um, that has to do with, that will produce a stimulating hormone for cortisol um, can decrease that stimulating hormone and overall cause a lowered cortisol response. So that stress hormone that, you know, we often don't want to see too high in these patients, it's actually too low causing fatigue. So we can do salivary cortisol testing on patients that we, that we suspect this hap is happening in, and um, we can do many things to to mitigate to to stimulate cortisol release and to regulate it throughout the day. Okay, so this is a study that looked at the oxidative damage that occurs during an acute COVID nineteen reaction, and um, and how the levels of antioxidants present in the in the systems of the patients who were exposed to covid affected their outcomes so what we found is that the um 
so backing up for a second, what, what happens during an, the acute viral phase is that our body creates a lot of these reactive oxygen species in order to kill the virus. And while that's effective in killing the virus, that can also damage our own tissues. So um, we've seen that with damage to lung tissues and vascular tissues after COVID. And it does that by creating these reactive oxygen species that create free radicals that can then um, damage our, our cells at a, uh, and, and cause tissue damage at a cellular level. And what antioxidants do, um, they're, you know, these molecules that are found in a lot of colorful fruits and vegetables. And what they do is they bind those free radicals and prevent them from doing damage to our tissues by shuttling them into their molecular structure. So they're very cool molecules. And what they found in this study was that the level of antioxidants that people had in their system during their infection um, determined it was protective against long COVID. So um, this is, again, something that we want to pay a lot of attention to when we're talking about prevention and acute treatment during the acute viral phase um, to prevent that damage from those free radicals during that phase. Ways that we can evaluate the post-viral syndrome if we're suspecting it in a patient, we're usually starting off with some blood work. And this is really important um, as we're gonna see here in a second because understanding if there's been tissue damage and mitigating that as quickly as possible is really the name of the game here. And we also wanna rule out and make sure that there aren't other um, pathologies going on to kind of understand that this might be a post-viral syndrome. In fact, we see a lot of times we're, you know, as healthcare workers, there's a lot of, um, you know, sweeping, under the rug sort of thing with or disregarding patients saying, I'm feeling too fatigued, I'm having brain fog, things aren't working quite correctly for me. So with our clinic, we're really interested in looking at evidence-based medicine. So we do wanna see what's going on with somebody's CBC and that tells us if our patients might, might be anemic, might be dealing with oxygen transfer issues. It also tells us what's going on with their white blood cells, where the body is sorting those white blood cells into, if they're making more neutrophils, which are kind of first responders or more of those monocytes, which are chronic responders, kind of helps us know what the immune system is trying to accomplish. And that's a pretty inexpensive test. Same with the CMP. Now that's a comprehensive metabolic panel that's going to screen organ function like liver and kidney function, give us an idea of what's going on with electrolytes as well as glucose management, our blood sugar. We usually are wanting to see what's going on with thyroid too, because those endocrine Endocrine, endocrine glands as hormones can be very deeply affected by post-viral syndrome and by the inflammation that's been created. We want to know what's going on with certain immune markers, making sure that an autoimmune cascade hasn't started and an autoimmunity isn't a secondary process that's happening from that, that acute viral syndrome. We might check things like ANA within that. We might be looking at the CD4 uh, and 8 markers to see what the immune system is, is doing there. A lot of times we'll also want to look at certain inflammatory markers. Now this might be something like CRP, C-reactive protein, homocysteine, maybe sed, sed rate. Um, sometimes we'll look at D-dimer, looking at what's going on with with lungs and making sure that there's not any pulmonary embolism issues. Sometimes we're also looking at ferritin because even though that's an iron storage marker, it tells us about acute inflammatory reactivity. And then a simple urinalysis also can give us an idea about kidney involvement too. We'll also want to look at vitamin D levels for our patients who are starting to feel chronically ill. Sometimes we'll look at things like B12 and zinc as well, and certain other antioxidant and mineral markers to make sure that they have what they need to really um, get over this post-viral issue. 
There are some specialty tests that we've found at our clinic to be very helpful. For some patients, if we're dealing with initially a respiratory illness, like something like uh, COVID-19, sometimes we're thinking about running different PCR analyses of either the nasal tissues or the uh, throat and um, mouth tissue. And that will help us screen for several different pathogens to make sure that we don't have other pathogenic activity that might be active and acute that could be really triggering the immune system into still be fighting and still be inflaming. So those will rule out different bacteria, funguses, as well as several different viruses and can be really, really helpful, as well as run antibiotic gene resistance uh, genes on those pathogens if they do show up. That really helps us understand what we need to be treating if there's a concern of extra um, infection going on. There are also other ways to look at what the immune system is doing. And one of those is an immune reactivity screening that we'll do with certain pathogens. And that is IgG testing, which looks at this ongoing inflammatory reaction from the immune system. And that's done with a simple blood draw. We use this lab um, called Cyrex to get that done. And you can see the different pathogens here that are listed that that's screening for. So if those are coming up, we know that the body is tagged those. Maybe the infection isn't acute, but it's something the immune system is still actively working on trying to, to fight against. Now, why this is important to get some of this testing done it really comes down to the trajectory of how well people can get over these post-infectious or post-viral syndromes. And this is a big deal. So this was a meta-analysis study, this article that was done um, where they were looking, this is even before COVID-19 came out, but they were saying, hey, if we can diagnose and treat these post-viral inflammatory syndromes that are happening, then we can save people a lot of grief and, you know, the, the pain and agony of being, you know, debilitated by these post-viral issues. And we can also save a lot of money for the healthcare industry, as well as with productivity for employment and things like that. So this really is a favorable, favorable thing for our uh, economy and our community to really make sure we are supporting people who feel like they are experiencing these post-viral syndromes because they are real according to the medical literature and, and we want to know as soon as possible to help them get better faster. Thanks Dr. Molly. I'll, I'll take it from here. So Ultimately, this is the next uh, phase of our doc talk where we talk about prevention and treatment. And this is a lot of, you know, this is naturopathic care at its core, right? We talk about how do we prevent uh, the, the illness in the first place. And then we talk about how do we support the immune system and the body's innate ability to heal during an acute uh, illness. And then how do we support the recovery, right? So this is, this feels like uh, very true to, to our uh, naturopathic nature here. Um, so prevention, if we could go on to the next slide. Uh, prevention of post-viral syndrome this happens before you even get the virus in the first place, right? <laughs> so this is a lot of the stuff we talk about with um, just, you know, treating all sorts of symptoms uh, that patients come in with. But it's especially important with pre for preventing post-viral syndrome is ultimately has to do with how do we support the immune system and an adequate immune response that doesn't uh, also lead to an out of control inflammatory response, right? And so that's kind of what these prevention slides are talking about. Um, basics of prevention include sleeping well. Uh, sleep is so important in healing. It is when we do our 
when we work through the, the physical difficulties in our body. And what I like to say, it's, it's also when we work through and, and digest our emotions. <laughs> so it work sleep is just so healing. And um, it's something that, yeah, insomnia affects a lot of patients, even before uh, they get that, that upper respiratory infection. Stress management, it goes hand in hand. This goes back to the topic that Mary discussed uh, in that COVID can decrease cortisol levels, right? And low cortisol leads to poor prognosis. Um, so stress management, stress being high cortisol states, but with people who have adrenal fatigue who are chronically stressed, those are low cortisol states. So this is a really big thing just in general for a stable immune system. Um, it's another big, big piece of the basics here. Diet, this probably won't surprise you, but it includes antioxidants, anti-inflammatory agents, and additional antivirals. Um, and so I like to, you know, I really, I really, uh, suggest to a lot of my patients um, to try to switch to a more plant-based diet, not exclusively, but meaning ultimately we're getting our multivitamin from the plants, uh, the vegetables that we're eating. Um, in that we're getting a lot of them, uh, five to seven servings a day, two to three servings of fruit. This is kind of a Terry Wales protocol. Uh, if you are familiar with her, she has a diet that um, looks very much this way. And it, it's how she treats MS, uh, which is an inflammatory autoimmune syndrome. Um, just quickly going through these omega-3 fatty acids, we'll talk more about those later. And then antiviral foods, garlic, onions, leeks, shallots, these are amazingly antiviral but would not be very good for our SIBO patients. Um, so it very much has to do with the, the patient here. And then mushrooms are immunomodulating, which means that they modulate the immune system up when it needs help kind of working through something and they modulate it down when it's overactive. So here's another long list of the vitamins and minerals that uh, really support a, an immune system that is a healthy response. Vitamin D, we'll talk through this one uh, in, in the next few slides, um, but ultimately there's a lot of data on uh, low vitamin D levels leading to a, a bigger, a, a more severe uh, illness what, of all sorts of viruses, but namely COVID. So low, low vitamin D levels le can lead to uh, worse symptoms, uh, and especially something that we see with post-viral syndrome. Um, like Dr. Molly suggested, vitamin D is another one of those big lab tests that I definitely want to check when a patient comes in with post-viral syndromes. Um, again, this is a whole big list of, of our vitamins and minerals. Um, I'll just pop over to the minerals section here where we talk about zinc uh, as being really helpful in the immune system, uh, namely in that it helps with cell differentiation and development of the variety of immune cell types. Um, this is, yeah, very important. So you probably have heard of, of taking zinc for um, when you are sick, but ultimately we're talking about preventing the sickness in the first place with some of our uh, vitamins and minerals. Selenium is an excellent antioxidant. Uh, it's one that I use commonly, especially with my thyroid uh, patients who have low thyroid. Um, it helps lower the oxidative stress in the body. Oxidative stress is helpful short-term, but long-term would lead to an increased infl inflammation reaction. Um, and so, yeah, just that, that's a great slide to refer back to um, later on. So vitamin D, here is a uh, systematic review and meta-analysis on the impact of vitamin D levels uh, in COVID-19. So 
As I mentioned briefly earlier, low serum vitamin D is significantly associated with a higher risk of COVID-19 infection, right? So if you can imagine in the Pacific Northwest, where we just don't get a lot of sun and we're commonly inside, uh, a lot of patients end up with low vitamin D levels. So we're not setting ourselves up very well for, for being able to fight an acute illness. Sufficient vitamin D levels uh, work. So, so the flip side here is sufficient vitamin D levels are associated with a reduced risk of infection and a decreased severity, hence a lower risk of post-COVID syndrome. Um, so this is just really interesting stuff. Uh, vitamin D is immunomodulating. Uh, it helps not just with uh, symptom management and uh, post-COVID prevention of COVID, but also other viruses. Uh, it inhibits hyperinflammatory reactions uh, and can accelerate the healing process of affected areas. And some of the uh, research I looked at had all sorts of different dosing strategies um, from one single really high dose of vitamin D to a prolonged kind of lower physiologic dose. So there's all sorts of ways to boost the vitamin D. Um, and we're starting to see in the literature the, the variety of, of um, yeah, treatment options. I'll just pop in and say, this is a typo here. This wasn't in 2016. There was no COVID back then. This is 2021 that this was published. So there are a variety of ways to supplement vitamin D3. It is a fat soluble vitamin. So you definitely wanna take it with food and especially food that contains fat. Otherwise it's not as well absorbed by the stomach lining. Um, yeah, you can take it in capsule form, in uh, liquid form, in liposomal form. Um, the studies I mentioned earlier about kind of a single dose being uh, really helpful for an acute viral illness. We're talking about 200,000 IUs as a single dose. That's sort of what I saw in the literature. Um, that is a really rare recommendation that I make, but it's just kind of to give you a sense for the wide variety of, uh, of ways this is prescribed. All right. So next we're going to move from prevention into the acute treatment of a viral illness. So as I was mentioning before, the degree of the reactivity, um, the way that our immune system reacts during the acute viral illness will have major implications for the development of a post-viral syndrome. So we're really trying to um, kind of uh, modulate the immune system like Dr. Rosalie was describing. So we want to make sure that it's acting at an adequate level, that we're not stressing our body out in other ways, but that we're preventing the immune system from overreacting as well during um, overreacting to the virus that, um, that's present in our body. So the duration of this is about two to four weeks. Um, when you have COVID, the recovery time might be longer than you expect. So think about giving yourself extra time and space if possible and kind of reducing your overall um, stressors, including alcohol, sugar, fried, heavy, fatty foods, um, you know, staying up all night and things like that. You really want to make sure that you're getting enough sleep in this phase as well. Um, you may want to consider bringing in melatonin if you're if you're having a hard time sleeping during the acute phase. Um, and as we'll discuss later, melatonin not only helps us sleep, but it's a really great antioxidant for the brain. You want to, um, again, pay attention to stress management, um, and that's particularly after your you're feeling well again um, for about a month out. Just treat yourself kindly. 
Um, and then for the diet, you want to avoid all refined carbohydrates and sugars, and then avoid heavy fatty and fried foods. So really giving yourself um, food that's easy to digest and has a lot of antioxidant and antiviral support in it. So this is often soups, um, or you want to consider, especially in that first one to two weeks, soups with clear broths. So you want to think about chicken broth or miso, um, add ginger, mushrooms, and garlic for the antiviral support. And then you want to increase your citrus for vitamin, for getting a lot of vitamin C. So here are some um, antioxidants that we can take in higher doses during the acute phase uh, to, to, again, qu um, quench those free radical um, oxidative species production that our, that our immune system will produce um, in an, for the viral response. So N-acetylcysteine is a great one for, that's really specific to the respiratory system, the respiratory mucosa. Um, it's a mucolytic and helps um, slow mucus production and thin it during, so if you're having sinus congestion during, especially a COVID reaction, um, this can be really helpful. And it's a precursor to glutathione, which is, uh, one of the, a really important antioxidant for the brain as well. Um, so then again, glutathione, it's the, considered the master antioxidant in the brain. Um, and it's involved in many cellular processes, um, including detoxification and helps with antiviral defense and mitigating the immune response. So making the immune system respond well, but not over respond. Um, and we also have quercetin as another um, friend of ours during this acute phase. This is an extract of many different plants. It's found in nettles and many other herbal medicines. Um, and this one's also an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory and immune modulating. Um, so we want to consider having one or all of these on board during that acute phase. And then next we have antiviral herbs. So there's many different antiviral herbs from all the different traditional herbal systems, but here are some of kind of the, the ones that we go to. Um, that, these are my kind of quick go-tos when someone has a viral illness. Um, Andrographis uh, is known as king of the bitters in Ayurvedic medicine. Um, it's antiviral, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory as well. Um, and it regulates inflammation and stimulates the cells that fight the virus. So this is going to be stimulating to the immune system, um, but also helping mitigate the, our response um, on a cellular level. Next, we have astragalus. Um, this is a, another immune modulator. Um, it's a little bit more gentle than andrographis. Andrographis is like our heavy hitting antiviral herb. Astragalus is on board to kind of calm the waters and act as more of an immune modulator. Um, and then we've got lemon balm. This is also a more gentle antiviral herb. Um, this is something you can kind of sip throughout uh, cold and flu season for prevention, and then also drink it pretty frequently during treatment. And then lastly, we have licorice, um, which is another really great antiviral and anti-inflammatory herb that actually contains a molecule that is similar to cortisol. So really great in more strongly reducing the inflammatory response if that's what's happening in your body during a viral infection. We've talked about before we get this viral insult, we've talked about what to do preventatively during the viral insult. Now let's talk about the post-viral stuff because that's what a lot of you here are here to talk about today. So of course, this duration of 
you know, how long might someone need support for post-viral treatment comes up quite a bit with our patients. And really this is as long as they're dealing with symptoms and feeling like they have not rebalanced their system. So we kind of break this in our clinic down into three major categories. We've got our mitochondrial supportives. We've got our anti-inflammatory supports, which includes our antioxidants. And then we have these focalized treatments where we're really trying to tailor the treatment therapies towards the individual, depending on what tissues they had targeted and attacked and the areas that they need extra support in. So we're going to get into the mitochondrial support here on the next slide. Um, one example of a great mitochondrial supportive is resveratrol. It's important to think about cellular energy and we're gonna get into that. With antioxidants, we kind of think about it in these different categories with our omega-3s, which Dr. Rosalie had touched on, it's being really important anti-inflammatories that are coming in both through our food and can be supplemented. We know that curcumin does a lot of heavy lifting, that's our extract of turmeric in regards to anti-inflammatory support, and we see this supported in the medical literature as well. And then our antioxidants, we kind of break those down into things like our plant extracts, melatonin being a very, very strong antioxidant. We're going to talk about that and show you some research about it as well. And then our cruciferous veggies. So that's like our broccoli and our cabbage family. When we're thinking about focalized areas that may need to be supported, that might include that hormonal system, potentially a thyroid or sex hormones, our endocrine support. It may have to do with the neurocognitive system. We know that a lot of these inflammatory markers pass through the blood brain barrier and can cause things beyond just brain fog and um, fatigue. We also know that there are a lot of natural substances that can really support the nervous system itself, whether it has to do with peripheral neuropathy support or supporting to re-engage those, those senses that have been lost in regards to the, the smell and the taste. So mitochondria, we think about that as the energy productive little factory in each of our cells. So the, the mitochondrial precursors include things like glucose or carbohydrates, ketones and oxygen. And then those combine with these, what we call cofactors, which are like building blocks. And you'll see there a whole bunch of vitamins you're gonna, you're, and minerals that you're gonna recognize. There are B vitamins, we've got our carnitine, vitamin C, K, magnesium, calcium. And and then we have this very important glutathione antioxidant that's involved in the creation that leads ultimately to energy or ATP. So we can have an activation or a disruptive of our mitochondria. And what that equals for us is cellular energy. And ultimately that's gonna have a very grave impact on our overall energy and our ability to function. So we really want to be supporting the mitochondria. There are antioxidants that will help with the cleaning and the regulation of the mitochondria and support its activity. And those include glutathione, curcumin, which is that turmeric extract, sulforaphane, which we like this Brocco Protect to get people that, and then resveratrol. And these are the some of the best studied antioxidants that specifically have been studied to affect that mitochondrial function. And when we think about the damage that's done to the mitochondria in these during these viral infections, these are some of our most heavy lifters and some of the things that we see make the biggest impact for our patients overall well-being. So cofactors, we don't want to just gloss over those. So we've listed them out for you here. Sometimes in our practice, we'll be giving combined cofactors. There's a great product called Mitochondrial Energy that we use quite a bit because it combines all of these cofactors that have been found in the medical literature to support the mitochondria and its function. Sometimes we'll also use D-ribose. We know that that directly impacts the ATP, which is like our energy packets for ourselves production. And that's a direct type of carbohydrate to help feed that process. I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Rosalie. This is an exciting uh, new treatment as well. Thanks, Dr. Molly. So if you can get the basic gist here, 
when we're talking about post-viral syndromes, we're talking about a lot of inflammation, right? And the, the immune system sort of has an, has an inflammatory dysregulation. So hence why so many of our treatments, prevention, acute and post-viral, focus on antioxidants and immune uh, regulators and anti-inflammatories. So it's just, I, I'm so humbled by this topic because it's just the little viruses that are so, you know, they're just not visible to the naked eye. You need like a very, very good microscope. <laughs> They are able to 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 yield uh, such a strong hand here, um, and yeah, there's also just uh, yeah, I'm just sharing a, a personal moment of just just in awe of the viruses among us. Um, but going, if we go back to our previous slide, the the anti-inflammatories here. Um, this is a new class of anti-inflammatory molecules. Uh, it's new, they're newly just developed. They're called specialized pro-resolving mediators. And they're actually kind of like fractionated omega-3s and omega-6s. So they've kind of, in a way, concentrated the omega-3s and pulled out the, the very anti-inflammatory um, pieces of them and and uh, they are more readily absorbed. These pro-resolving mediators are uh, able to support the body's natural ability to respond to physical challenges in helping the body resolve the initial steps of the inflammatory process. So it's kind of like an immune modulator, anti-inflammatory. This is one that I've seen clinically work uh, it had high doses. We're dosing this pretty high uh, for, for a few weeks and kind of tapering down. I've seen it clinically help uh, significantly with post-viral fatigue uh, and exercise uh, intolerance. Another one of our anti-inflammatories is melatonin, right? Uh, Dr. Mary talked about it previously as a, as a potent antioxidant as well. It is all three, right? Antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and immunomodulating. Uh, and this, in the scientific literature, the dosing strategies are all over the place. Low dose is below one milligram a day, higher doses, one to 10 milligrams. Sometimes I see it dosed at 20 milligrams for very certain cases. There's different ways you could take it, a liposomal, like under the tongue form, or one that's sustained release that would uh, help with the middle of the night wakings. So we have a, a, a variety of different types of melatonin here in different doses. Um, the following slide will talk about um, the, the literature on it. So melatonin has been shown to be uh, really helpful in long COVID syndromes. So ultimately this is uh, a, a re review article, I believe from October of last year that describes the mechanisms in which they propose melatonin to be helpful in uh, diminishing the symptoms of COVID and especially long COVID. So again, they're citing the fact that it's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, immunomodulating. Um, the dosages range um, from two to 10 milligrams. So we're talking about higher doses of melatonin here. Um, you're probably familiar with melatonin as being a sleep aid, right? This is very much a different way of using it uh, in that its, it's use is a, as an antioxidant. But of course, we would still dose it at night because it has that nice effect of helping us sleep. So this graph was sort of at the end of the article, um, uh, the research study, showing all of the various ways that are proposed in which uh, melatonin helps with inhibiting uh, MECFS, meaning um, just the, the um, brain fog syndrome and chronic fatigue syndrome related with uh, long COVID. So from you know boosting ATP 
to diminishing reactive oxygen species, which are inflammatory, uh, to uh, diminishing muscle fatigue. There's just a lot of different proposed mechanisms for this, um, this small little supplement. Um, in a lot of ways it can help us. All right. Thank you, Rosalie. That was fascinating. All right. So next we're going to talk about the uh, peripheral neuropathy and nerve pain and what you can do about it. So peripheral neuropathy refers to numbness and tingling usually, but it can also be a decreased sensation or muscle weakness. Um, and this is something that can worsen after a viral infection. Um, so some of the ways that we treat this with some with supplements are going to be lion's mane. Um, this is a mushroom that you can see on the upper left hand corner that can help with the nervous tissue repair. And then we have alpha lipoic acid. This helps with blood sugar regulation, so it can be helpful for diabetic neuropathies um, and also has been shown to help with other types of neuropathies as well. And then lastly, we have B12 that protects the myelin sheath. Um, and it's been, so it's obviously a, a vitamin that is present in a lot of our, it's helpful as a cofactor for a lot of our um, enzymatic reactions and neurotransmitter synthesis in the body. Um, but it's also proposed to have an antioxidant effect when used in large amounts for this nervous system um, purpose. Um, and then lastly, for peripheral neuropathies, what I really use often is acupuncture. So um, a lot of my patients that I'm using acupuncture on are have um, numbness and tingling in their feet or hands, and that can be um, often after a viral infection. Um, and, you know, sometimes people who had it beforehand, it'll worsen after a viral infection. Um, and I find that the use of electroacupuncture is quite effective in a lot of patients. Usually after a couple of treatments, they'll have relief um, or at least a change in sensation that lasts for a few days. And then um, by, you know, as we keep going, they'll have a more sustained um, change and relief um, to the point where we can space treatments out over time. All right, so here's a research article that looked at the use of B12 for long COVID. And what they found was that um, there was an improvement in nerve pain and neuropathy symptoms that were um, that had happened um, post virally. And um, they so there was a number of studies, so two randomized randomized controlled clinical trials and five meta-analyses. Meta so those are studies that kind of take a number of studies and look at the overall results. Um, so that's a good amount of data that we were working with. Um, and it reported, so all of those studies reported benefit of the B12 supplements um, in either the methylcobalamin um, and cy cyanocobalamin forms. Um, so another thing to think about when you're um, struggling with the neurological symptoms after COVID or other viral infections. Um, and this is just a reminder that we have a number of different types of, of B12 available in our, um, either from injections from the physicians or in our apothecary. We have an active chewable B12 that contains methylfolate. That's really important uh, to take the methylated form um, if you have a any um, defects in your MTHFR gene. So something to consider, want to think about the form of B12 and folate that you're taking. Um, we also have a liquid form um, and then the methyl guard plus that contains a number of B vitamins plus the um, hydrochloric acid that can aid the absorption of B12. Um, and then B12 injections can be really great when you have a digestive issue that's 
um, preventing you from properly absorbing B12 um, or certain autoimmune conditions can do that as well. Um, so that's another thing that we offer here that uh, patients have really benefited from. All right. And then lastly, we've got acupuncture for anosmia. So anosmia is a fancy term for a lack of sense of smell. And, um, you know, as you may have heard, this is a big deal after COVID infections. Um, and it's been tricky. Sometimes it resolves you know, within a week or two afterwards, and sometimes it persists. Um, and acupuncture is another thing to consider if you are struggling with a either decreased or frank lack of smell after a viral infection. Um, there are not many large studies on this yet, but there's more attention being paid to it. And they've seen improvement in some case studies after a 10 week treatment period. Um, so again, something we need to do more research on, but it's something that is emerging as a potential solution um, for anosmia. And as we know that anosmia can happen in both of the categories of the main categories of that post viral long haulers COVID um, issue, it can be really impactful, especially for the kids. So with kids, we see a really reduced appetite. So that can be a problem when they're growing and needing all their nutrients. So definitely something that you want support um, for if that's impacting the person. This kind of concludes our talk today on the post-viral syndromes. And we're gonna take questions here in a second, but we also wanted to make sure we invite you to our um, talk that's gonna be happening that second Tuesday in June. And it's gonna be updates on HRT or bioidentical hormones or what we're gonna really focus on. And we're gonna talk about the um, myriad of research that's come out that's kind of, uh, been talking about whether it's going to be a healthy option for people or a not so healthy option for people. And we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of symptoms that can be managed as well as preventative um, de degenerative changes that can happen that it may be supportive for. So we want to just invite you to that. And then we also want to just invite you, if you have any questions about post-viral syndrome or want a really unique individualized treatment plan designed, that's what we do here. Um, please know that there, there is support for you. If you're faced with a post-viral syndrome or somebody you love is, um, get in contact with us and we'll help you figure out what the right amount of some of these antioxidants might be or some of these minerals and modulating um, substances because we're, we're, um, you know, really, this is, this is what we love to do. Love to help people. So let's look at questions. If there are any, so there was a good question from Nancy earlier asking about optimal vitamin D levels and Dr. Rosalie jumped in and answered that. So I'll let her um, take that over, but I will put a quick plug in for the fact that we did a vitamin D um, presentation, I think just two months ago. So go ahead and make sure you check out our uh, videos, which are on our website under education doc talks, you'll find them there. And there's an entire one on vitamin D that might really delve into that for you. Yeah, this is an excellent question. What, what are considered the optimal vitamin D levels and normal levels per the lab reference range are from 30 to hundred nanograms per milliliters. But I really like to see these much higher than 30. The low normal range is, is, uh, correlated with a lot of symptoms I've seen clinically. So I, I think my optimal levels are closer to 75 nanograms per milliliters. And honestly, I don't see those levels very frequently. Um, it's hard to get up to that uh, dose in, or to that level in, in the blood in this specific climate in the Pacific Northwest where the sun rays are just not hitting our skin. Uh, for enough time during the day for enough of the months of the year. 
And when we did that big literature review just a few months ago, that was really seconded by the literature. It really was supported that we want those those higher levels closer to that 75. 